Yes, people, Killer Keller here. This is the Street Culture Podcast, live at Arts Arcade for Piccadilly, Keller Vision. This is where we deep dive into the background of artists that have started from the ground and raised their way through the commercial backdrops of the city of Metropolis. Today, we have a very special guest, a man that is politically driven in all the arts um, across the board, different mediums, and one hell of a character. He goes by the name of Heath Kane. <laughs> Heath Kane inside the place. How are you, my brother? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> thanks for inviting me. It's fantastic having you here, you know. Um, a maverick in the game, so to speak, you know, throwing, uh, uh, throwing your caution to the wind and going for it through art. I mean, uh, that as, a, as an occupation to most people is one that they don't try and uh, try and walk, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know how to come back on that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. How you been? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, no, I'm always sort of get my back up when I come into London because I just I'm not I, I just don't like being around loads of people. So talk to yeah. me about this. that. that, that that's an artistic artistic trait as well, isn't it? You know. Yeah, I think so. Like I, you know, when COVID happened, I, you know, most people obviously sort of regressed and thought it was hell, but mm. I didn't even notice it was going on because you're just stuck in the studio by yourself anyway. You're doing it anyway. So yeah. socially distant for like ten years. So <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that played out. I mean, for a lot of people, it was a wake up call. For other people, it was just another day in the office, right? Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Well, and it, it was great for artists because uh, everyone was stuck indoors looking at blank walls and just ordering art. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a, a period which I don't think anyone will ever reclaim back again. No. From, no. So. Did, you, did you get an upshot? Was there an upshot? Oh, yeah, enormous. That was one of the probably only industries, that and probably interiors, which just went gangbusters mm. during COVID. Everyone else obviously struggled. But then, you know, what I did at that time was I gave back uh, quite a bit um, for people who were struggling. So, yeah, it's, it's a nice way of balancing things out. Now, of course, with the cost of living, art's the one that gets it up the arse the, the hardest, I think, because no one mm. spends money unless you want to burn it. So, mm. yeah. How does that, how does that compro compromise your uh, creative output so far as adjusting to the social climates? I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm probably just face forward I, I just try and look at uh, moving forward and not worrying about too much the circumstances I mean it's hard not to but but I think my sort of like idea is just very much just focus on what you want to do like at the moment I think it's very much just about using the time when, when things are sort of slow you know use that to your advantage and actually mm -hmm. spend the time doing creative things yeah. you know when you're busy you don't have that time you're just constantly sort of going all the time mm. so so i think if anything i'm just using it just to experiment and do loads of new things mm. does it come with a level of um wait uh, does it come with a level of anxiety like when you have those down times because obviously you've got let like, the well fill right yeah, I think, you know, I mean, it's, with any artist, whether you're a musician or whatever, if, if you're not getting that sort of feedback, and, and unfortunately with art, a lot of the feedback is through people who want to buy your art. And mm. if people aren't buying your art, um, then you start to question, have I fucking missed the point, you mm. know? So, but I don't know. I, um, I think it, it certainly helps having platforms where people you can engage with and you get the sort of feedback um mm. so i i don't leave i try and avoid the sort of economic part of it out of it and just try and see you know feedback from people and if if they like it they like it i mean if they didn't like it i'd be obscure and just mm. would be forgotten wouldn't i so but that always humbles you doesn't it as an artist to know that there always is that air, that that grey area, that dark area where, you know, you want to kind of defer as much as possible from, but then it actually allows for a new idea, a fresh idea to come about, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think that's the thing, you just got to look at it. I mean, I just see it as an opportunity. Mm. It's just, and any time, I, I think I'm just that, sort of have that mindset where, where I always try and push myself like I'm uh, very competitive against myself, but have absolutely no interest in like, you know, team sports or anything mm -hmm. like that. But I always constantly push myself just because I just think, you know, I'm only on this planet for a certain amount of time. I may as well go out, you know, being as obnoxious as possible. So, <laughs> <laughs> Would you say you were stoic? Is that a stoic uh, mindset? Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I mean, I... I don't know. I think, you know, definitely think I'm wired differently to most people, but... Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, th I think, 
I think there's two things that sort of drive me. Is one, I've just got to a point where I just sort of taken my focus away from, you know, what you kind of expected to do in society and mm. provide and that. Um, you know, I was quite fortunate. I've, I've made money in my career doing things that, looking back at, probably weren't, the you know, the things that I'm most proud of. Mm. But... And now... Were you a drug dealer or something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that might be something to be proud of. Uh, no, I used, to work, um, I used to just work in uh, luxury goods. So oh. if the sort of backstory of my work and the reason why a lot of my work is sort of very much directed at wealth is largely because I was very much at the forefront of, of sort of seeing in a marketing capacity. Well, first hand. Yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, there's there's luxury and then there's mm. like the kind of, you know, uber luxury and that's where I was sort of positioned. Mm. So there's about five, five companies or five people in the world who really sort of specialised in uh, luxury branding and that's what I used to do. Wow. Um, so, yes. Wow, so you were really at the forefront of brand design? and Yeah, so I, for my sins, I used to help sell some of the most expensive property in London wow. and some places in the world. Fantastic. So, but what I've, I guess what I've taken from that, um, you know, what um, I guess from, from learning about what it is that encourages people to depart with money is, is normally stories. It's not the the item itself it's it's you know the story that goes mm. with it and so that's very much if you look at my art my art does the exact same thing it's just compounded with stories and mm. messages and so the art itself is just a capsule to to create you know storytelling so um yeah i mean that's that's how you depart with people's money at the end of the day is mm. is get them to believe into a story mm. um well I mean, it obviously helps to have something nice looking as well. But yeah, that's yeah. That's different. And believe me, if you guys haven't checked out Heath, I mean, actually, funny you say that because um, one thing about you, which I feel like you're extremely prolific on, is all the different areas which you cover to enhance and embellish the stories, whether it be blogs or um, you know the, the content that you curate on online, the Instagrams. It's all you know to the wire. Oh, thank to, you. to explain, you know, yeah, to, 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 to break down the explanation and give people an, an entry into your thinking. Um, well, it's probably not deliberate, but if it comes across that way, then it's great. But no, I, I think I'm very considered in the way that I approach things. I just, I, I feel, I mean, I guess at the heart of it, you know, a lot of my work is political mm. and anyone will relate at the moment mm. that you feel like you are just got no empower or, mm. or not empowered to be able to make a difference, you know. Mm. But what, you know, what I found which has some sort of power is the ability to have a voice which can carry through messages. Mm. But I guess this is something that I'm kind of almost dedicating a lot of my life to is trying to work out how do you not persuade people, but how do you get a conversation moving to make people think? Cause mm. that, you know, I think through the inception of the internet, you just see how, how sort of prolific like the divisions have become mm. and how wild some of these like, you know, conspiracy theories and just belief structures. You just think, you know, like if you dive into it, you can, you can uncover how quickly um, mm. these these misinformations are just flat out lies. Mm. It's, so, it's quite a, a tribalistic. I mean, you mentioned you're not really a, a sports fan, so no. to speak. Um, you know, the, the world is based on tribalism, isn't it? And uh, you know, whether it's football or uh, you know rugby or whatever. You know, there, there's obviously a a, a, a a thought pattern that people fall into depending on either a demographic or um, just just that that empowered feeling as if like they they, they know more than the, than the outside than the inside do. Yeah, but I guess it's just culturally belonging, right? So whatever you do, if you're into sport, it's it's about having been part of a community. Mm. And uh, you know, my community I guess revolves around art and 
and politics, as boring as that probably sounds, but it's sure. just that, you know, you're, you're going to go where those endorphins kind of give you the biggest kick, right? Mm. So that's, that's, to me, that's the thing that I engage with. Mm. I like that sort of stimulus. I don't like watching other people kick around a bit of leather mm. um, for an hour. So, mm. But you say stimulus, that's, that's interesting from a creative's point of view. Without these questions of the day, then where does your art go? I, I was just wondering whether you mentioned where you live was, you know, quite the conservative belt um, and perhaps putting yourself in those environments uh, as a creative, that heightens that stimulus to want to make more noise. I mean, like London is, you know, it's metropolis. There's not enough space to make noise yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and life just continues without us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when you're in, <laughs> when you're in the heat, that, that empowers you to make some of the most more critical decisions based on your environment, right? I guess so. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm in a very re sort of a relaxed place. I mean, you could fair to say it's kind of a bubble because the problems that anyone around us are trivial compared yeah. to the, you know, the real problems that I tried to help try mm. and um, address. But, um, you know, needless to say, I'm, I, I, I kind of... I again sort of look at from the side of in in our area there's a lot of farmers and rural sort of things. Oh lovely. Nice. Um yeah, so I like the idea that we don't have like the big homogenized sort of um rollout of mm. uh, stores. I mean big up all the John Lewis crew. We know you're out there, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well it's more the case like, you know, you just go any place, any city now and it's mm. just the same kind of set of shops. Mm. You know, it's just like a blueprint wherever you go, and then you've got this sort of American model where you go out of town now and you've got the same set of shops in these same sort of like factory settings mm. and you just think, you know, this this is what we've been reduced to as humans. That yeah, has it come no to choice. this. Yeah. That's so interesting you say that because socially they, there is that feeling of society as a whole just plodding along, you know, not got time to take a breath and look around, right? Yeah. So, no, that was the kind of my, what instigated me wanting to move out because we've just got a farmer's market where people come and sell the way they have for hundreds of years, mm. just straight from the fields, mm. come out onto that. And so... That's cute. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, it's also healthy as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's good for yeah. you. Yeah. Eat more, drink more. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just the style of life that I've kind of wanted. But, you know, I'm also a lot older, so mm. I'm kind of wanting to sort of just plateau off and, and do things that aren't as stupid as what I probably did when I was younger. How so. stupid did it get when you were younger? Like, I mean, we're talking, you know, your background is, you know, you've, you've gone, you've dipped your toe in corporate and didn't like it. But how... you? And being from Sydney, Australia, which you are, mm -hmm. that, that, I mean, you went from the frying pan into the fire, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I think I was very ambitious when I left um, without probably even knowing how much so. But I realised at an early age that um, there just wasn't the opportunities in Australia that I wanted to. So I started off in uh, animation, then went into design. And I just wow, realized, hold on, you hold on, you went into animation. Yeah, for a brief kind of well, I spent from the age of thirteen to the moment I left school at eighteen, knowing exactly what I wanted to do. So very focused, just homing in on art. Wow, I was uh, I really sort of like dodged school and just went straight into college and was doing. Um, uh, night courses in animation, really? and on the weekends doing life drawing courses because you very few people know in order to become an animator as much as it's about just um, minimizing your drawings down mm. to these single sort of shapes mm. you have to actually know about anatomy 100 so, percent. so you look at any kind of good animation you'll know that they actually understand an, um, anatomy so they know bone structure they know all these things and flow and how that works because it, it, otherwise it will look two-dimensional on on uh, and especially if you're rotating things you need to understand space and you know, so what year was this? What year was this you were...? Uh, God, now you're going back in time. Um, so this is probably 99 uh, or 1990. Um, so, so what kind of animation was it? Like cartoon or real? Yeah, so that, well, all I wanted to do, my focus was just do animation for uh, like uh, TV. Yeah, um, or like MTV like, sort of things? 
Uh, Nickelodeon? Just, just, yeah, just, you know, Coco Pops or, oh, or just anything that was a little bit off wall, yeah. you know, to sort of create something that was just wasn't Walt Disney. Yeah. But unfortunately, they had two options in Australia when I grew up, Walt Disney or this company called Euron Gross, and uh, right. neither ones were desirable. And uh, I um, took a, a sort of, a, I guess, um, a position to try and work at, at Walt Disney. But you know, the, at the time, and it was something on the lines of about twenty-four dollars for twenty-four um, uh, drawings, from what I remember. Wow! And if you you break that down, so the Australian dollar at the moment is basically two times. Mm. So. So you're talking about twelve pounds. This is, you know, thirty years ago. It's mm. not that much, sort of, you know, probably. But at that time, what, you know, what uh, essentially thirty pounds or um, the twenty-four dollars would buy you was a loaf of bread and some, mm. sand, you know, mm. you wouldn't even buy you the, the bus fare to go in. Yeah, totally. So that kind of just it just, you know. Uh, harpooned my dream of doing animation. You know who I rated back in the day when we were talking about mid to late nineties. I used to really rate John Kay and the whole Ren and Stimpy. Ah, oh, they were amazing. Mavericks. That, now you're talking about people that didn't give a fuck. Yeah, you, like go well, for it. That was it. I mean, that was that literally that came out just in a in a different sort of part of my life, which was a bit more reckless, but <laughs> kind of on. She's what Ren and Stimpy was essentially. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well. If you ever take drugs and watch Ren and Stimpy, <laughs> yeah. it, the world makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Canadian Yaksman and things like that. Oh, yeah, that's Canada. <laughs> but no, they were, they were brilliant. Um, but, yeah, so then I just got into design and spent the next whatever years. But, it, you know, I think when you look, there is this sort of crossover and I, I constantly try and sort of examine especially now when mm. you look at the sort of style of arts coming out, it's becoming more and more graphic design. Yeah, it is, isn't it? You know, you, I mean, particularly if you look at how many artists um, are just focused around typography mm. and you sort of think it's really interesting what this sort of literally blurring the lines between graphic design, which essentially is just commercial art, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and street art as well, which has, you know, it's it's... Added further value and enhanced that, you, know, you say that font, you know, American box font everywhere, yeah. you know, things yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, So that's the thing. So I'm, I, it's kind of left me really kind of questioning the sort of foundries of art. I mean, it goes back to probably, you know, the time of Duchamp, who sort of did his shit in a can and just went, what's art? You mm. know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and it and it's probably sort of spiralled down from there. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I think... Yeah, it's just an interesting time because for, you know, you, you've obviously, you know, talked to a lot of street artists. I don't pigeonhole myself in, in anything, you know. I'm, I don't blame you. I, um, I guess I know the style of my work. Mm. I, kind of, I kind of flicker between, I guess, activist art um, mm. or, or art activism. So I use art to, you know, provoke uh, conversations around society and mm. politics. Um, but... You know that can only sort of get so far, and then I sort of mix it up and do mm. you know art in I don't even know what you sort of brand it as, but it's just art that appeals to me. Yes, so, great. Yeah. What so talk to me about your day to day process in in creating, and you know what's 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 a day what's a, a regular day in in Heath's world? So I have the fortunate part of walking out of my door, walking across the street and straight into my studio. So it's literally... Uh, Blessings. <laughs> Blessings. Uh, yeah, like a two-minute walk um, to my studio. But um, no, I, um, I have... Um, I, I just sort of come in. I try and be fairly sort of disciplined and work out a schedule what I want to achieve th in the week. A lot of the stuff, I mean, you know, I think it's the same for anyone, you know, if you're in hip hop or whatever. In fact, there's this great song about the music industry where he just spends all his time on emails and doing promotion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And hardly ever sort of, you know, because he's... Have you, he, been, have you been spying on me? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the case. Like, it is, it is. You know, 70% of probably what I'm doing is just admin, you yeah. know, speaking to galleries and feeding them with new work and... You know, I probably have five percent where I'm actually sitting down thinking about you know new work. I mean, generally new yeah. work. The thing that for me um, 
is that I I very much focused on where I can evolve my work, not, you know, how just to commercialise my Mm, work. mm. So there's, you know, hats off to a lot of artists who've just done one thing and just kind of replicate it and just keep going. But I'm I my brain just can't sit and look at something without going. All right, that, I've done that. Yeah, yeah. Move on. You know, that's I'm, a creative trait in itself, though, isn't it? You know, it's, it's it's this feeling of constant. You need to replenish, keep moving, keep doing. And if you stay and look at something for too long, I mean, you drive you stir crazy, doesn't it? I th- well, it certainly does for me. But then I also see a lot of artists who've just stuck at it. And mm. I mean, I there are parts of me that sort of go. All right, well, you know, for instance, the very first thing I did, which harps back onto my background with uh, luxury goods, was this piece called Rich Enough to be Batman. It was the very first thing I did. I had no intention of actually selling it. <laughs> I just did it for myself because I thought it would be quite funny. And so the way it obviously works is I just took the, the queen from, um, you know, the pound note. Mm-hmm. She's in Australia. I generally grew up thinking she was the most powerful you know, richest person on the planet. I was all right with that, you know. Mm-hmm. Apparently she's been ordained by God, so, you mm-hmm. know, someone's given it. her a blessing. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, um, uh, I, I juxtaposed that with um, um, a sort of, a, I guess, a overlaid um, cowl of Batman and the idea being that Batman wasn't a superhero. He used his money to do good. Mm. And if you think of the Elon Musk and the Jeff Bezos in the world, mm. wouldn't it be nice if there were more people rich enough to be Batman? Yeah. That's what the piece is called. I love that analogy. What, an, what a concept. So it was a really simple thing, but when you looked at it, people just took it on the sort of, uh, I guess, the... Face value. The, yeah, the, the sort of veneer of it and just looked at it and just laughed because it kind of was almost defacing the queen. But it was never about that, you no. know. It, it's sort of that, I guess I describe my art as, it's that thing, that English thing where if you go up to someone and say, how are you? And mm. everyone will always say, fine. yeah, fine, thanks. Yeah. But downside, you just want to you vomit everything that's wrong with, yeah. you know, you and the world. And it's a very triggery word. Are yeah. you okay? It's, it's quite triggery, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's kind of my art. It, it has this sort of happiness to it. Like when people see the Queen with the Batman mask, they laugh and they mm. just think it's funny. But then when they realise the story behind it, they realise it's actually very sort of subversive and it's really dark. Mm. Because when you talk about money and talking about philanthropy and talking about that, you realise like, oh, that's fucking just horrible. Yeah, why aren't, why aren't you know, mm. people like Elon Musk doing something with it rather than building spacecraft, you know? Self-serving. Just, yeah, just quiet. So. Some of the best art is ladled with irony and, uh, you know, the, 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 the wider conversation piece. Um, we have to, I guess we have to forgive, forgive those that on entry see the comedic value in something, short-term comedic value in something. Um, but, but you, it, know, you know, it's a great uh, advertising trick because it's, and that's sort of where my upbringing, as I say, it kind yeah. of um, uh, kind of spearheads into it. It was this where you use, you know, comedy or use um, something to allure and mm. attract people into it. And whereas normally if you looked out your window and you're seeing adverts, you use bright colours to attract you, then mm. you kind of compound the message or the kind of subliminal buy this product. Mm. Mine's very much a message of anti-capitalism. It's very <laughs> much about why yeah. not to buy. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 for sure. So, so it's kind of reverse engineered. Yeah, I rate that. Um, going back to the administra- administrative side of, uh, of what you do, with that question, I have no doubt it occupies a lot of your your time as mentioned um I mean, and ideally it'd be nice to have it delegated to someone but but you're very hands-on and i think a lot of a lot of artists aren't hands-on when actually common sense prevails it doesn't take someone to be you know up in the top end of marketing to figure it out i think a lot of artists genuinely feel prohibited or you know air of self-doubt critical that they can't do something and they just have to stick with what they do on the flip side. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think, you know, it's, it's um, I think it's just one of those things. Well, I, I've, I've gone through this phase where, you know, my career kind of took off um, pretty early, very quickly. And, and then during COVID or just on the back of COVID, I had a team of people working for me because we were just... I guess exporting quite a lot of mm. of art, and then what's been kind of humbling and nice is with um, with um, you know 
with all the sort of crunch on, on people's income and cost of living is I've sort of had to sort of downsize and then just, but it, it's, it, I guess in a way it's been nice just to be able to control everything and mm. just, and it's, it's again growing um, once again, but it's just because I know how to sort of massage and keep things mm. moving. But at the same token, it's also, and I think when, you know, like anyone, if you're putting in the hours and you're seeing it being rewarded, it's mm. much more rewarding than just sort of like keep skimming and hope that it just keeps going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it, as I say, this here over the last year or two where things really kind of like sort of flatlined in the industry, um, you know, it's just been quite nice to go, how do I, how do I keep that momentum going? Yeah, yeah. Not just become, I mean, it's, it's sad, but, uh, you know, a truth that a lot of people just hit the wall, yeah. um, you know, in any sort of creative industry, um, they've just sort of gone, shit, there's just no work, you know, mm. there's no one's buying, no one's, mm. and so, you know, that's been kind of interesting to be able to use the admin side of things to kind of see how do I rebalance. But as I say, I just sort of went, all right, I can't change what's going on in mm. the world. Um, but what I can do is just use this to my advantage because mm. it's a downtime and I'm going to invest time in, in not invest in me, but just sort of explore mm. and, and be truly creative. Um, so, yeah, I've, um, you know, so I've, I made this conscious decision about two years ago to draw a line under Rich Not To Be Batman because I've, I've sold it all over the world mm -hmm. and it's so easy just to be known as that guy who did, Repeat, you know, repeat, yeah. repeat, yeah. And, um, that's, I, that's brave in itself. Yeah, well, it, when it's your cash cow, you know, you just go, shit, I'm going to mm. just stop it altogether and yeah. I'm going to have to come up with something else. And like rebrand, essentially. Yeah, I guess. Um, I mean, I see my work as variantly different, but a lot of people always comment that my work's got a signature, which I don't even see. Mm. But I'm, again, I'm slightly kind of not caring, but also conscious of the fact that I keep going off and go, I'm going to do something else. Like my latest collection is a collection with uh, balloon flowers. And, yeah, um, crazy. And it's called Oblivious. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the work that I do is consciously thought of into the title. Mm. So Rich Enough to Be Batman mm. um, speaks for itself. Um, and this one's called Oblivious because the idea is I did it deliberately to draw people in and go, isn't that cute? Mm. But it's a message uh, all around how what we should be doing is saying that's revolting. Yeah. Because, you know, we're in a culture now that's against plastics and against things that replace nature and all that. Mm. But here we are looking at this picture of uh, balloon flowers thinking it's cute. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And that's yeah. This, the kind of, I guess, the problem is that from an early age, we associate that kind of feeling of fun and happiness with things that from our childhood. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, we're at a generation now where our children are going to adopt all this crap that mm. we're, you know, we're producing in the last sort of 30, 50 years so much plastic that will last, you know, over the next thousand years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Do something about it, people, you know. <laughs> wake it, wake them up. Um, how do you measure your attack on um, the subject matter of new new uh, projects because obviously that's that's a sensitive subject matter one that needs to be uh, pushed even further but mm -hmm. of course like you're saying that there, there has to be that level of irony a sense of doesn't that look pretty like how do you measure that on balance so i think that's the that's the thing that is the golden ticket like with the rich not to be batman people laughed and they thought it was funny but they had that and whereas this is exactly the same so they have the same ingredient it's just I think that's the thing I constantly stumble. Like one of the, uh, a year ago I was, and it's something I'm very much trying to do, is uh, I did this project called Happy Propaganda. So if you look at, you know, um, the way, if you walked out the street and voiced an opinion, you're guaranteed to get half the people with you and half the people mm -hmm. against you, right? And I find that interesting and you can sort of see you know, just in this current general election, you can see how big these divisions are, like how people have gone from the Tories and gone further right wing and you think, fucking hell, like, yeah, 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 yeah. wow, like where does that come from, you know? And then you've got other people who are going even further. So 
so it's really hard to sort of make that balance. And so I wanted to see if if um, you could create art um, that was based on this, what was happening, which is propaganda. So, you know, again, social media and the perpetuation mm, of mm. messages going out there and, and people's how they want to digest their own narratives were coming at it from completely different angles. And... I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we could somehow bring people back? What if you could mm. reverse engineer propaganda mm. so that instead of it sort of dividing people, it actually brought them together? And I still, to this day, have not cracked it. But, you know, it's one of those things where if I do, then that I know is going to be the happy ticket, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the win, yeah. right? And um, what's your thought? Here comes a spicy one. What's your thoughts on, uh, you know, the middle of the road, get, uh, go along to get along, assimilate, um, uh, vanilla um, creatives out there that aren't adding some sort of public um, uh, announcement within their art that, that pushes that dial? What, what do you think? Of, what's your thoughts on m mediocrity? Oh, wow. Gosh, that's going to get me in some trouble. That's yes, right. <laughs> I, I, look, you know, there's, there's room for everybody, right? You know, it's like, um, uh, I, I guess for, uh, it's probably your mum saying there's someone out there for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a kind way of saying you're ugly, but yeah, you'll, yeah. <laughs> you'll get through life, you know. Um, I, I think it's that sort of reinsurement that, you know, people will always create art. And if it connects to one person and it changes them, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the the the, the kind of essence of art is is really about kind of engaging with people on a feel on a sort of I guess an emotional level. Yeah. Um, mine happens to be using emotions to draw people into a sort of cerebral level. I get them thinking about things, but you know, it's fine to just stop at at kind of feelings. You know, you mm. can. I mean, how many people have done Bowie? How many people mm. have done, I don't know, Mickey Mouse? How many people have done whatever? Mm -hmm. it, it kind of, at a sort of visceral level, it means nothing, right? It's mm -hmm. just, it's just you, could, you could argue and say it's remnant of our culture. So in 100 years' time, people will dig up and they'll go, what was the fascination with Bowie? And, mm. and they must have been great, you know? Kardashians but, and such. Well, exactly. But, you know, what I, what I like to think is in 200 years' time, if someone came across this sort of my art, they would actually go, there's something that this person was opposed to. Mm. So, like, um, you know, if you look at Brexit was a great example. Peep, the whole kind of uh, conversation around Bre uh, Brexit was an identity about going back to something great. You know, mm. we had the same message sort of being flown over the pond with with Trump saying let's make America great again and it's a really sort of dangerous thought that people have to look back at things and say you know yeah why can't we make it the way it was you know and you know what the danger on that is is that you become a regressive society you're trying to go back which you can never do oh that's interesting yeah you have to be a progressive society, but the mm. problem is people don't want to take the learnings from the past to know how to sort of improve the future. Mm. And that's what I think is, you know, if you dig back at art and if you find things, like there was this, uh, I, I remember going to um, uh, the uh, Royal Academy and they did an exhibition on uh, Russian propaganda. And I thought, great, this is just up my street. Mm. And I went in there and I was immediately disappointed because there were pictures of still life flowers. And, and really what it was, it was, it was to do with paintings that were done in a period under communist sort of arrest. And I thought, you know, they didn't, they didn't say anything. Like, yeah. this could be anywhere. They didn't, you didn't see the barriers. You didn't see the melancholy. You didn't see... What was really going on the ground yeah. at the time, yeah. And so I kind of want my art to be something that if it was found in a time capsule, people would go, yeah, let's not learn from that. You know, yeah. this, the past wasn't that great, you yeah. know. So, like, um, you know, often people uh, in the, in the 
uh, America go on about how the 60s was a great time and you go, really, was yeah, it? Yeah, how that worked out. Yeah. Nostalgia is yeah. a scary thing, isn't it? It's a really comfortable blanket, but it really does come back and bite. And that's the thing. And it's until you really get into that detail that you start to realize, no, you know, never have there has been a time in history where we have less wars, mm. less sort of, you know, famine, less all these things. So why would you go, want to go back to something? You yeah. Know? Was that the decline? Do you think the 60s, 70s were a level of creative decline where people, I mean, there were obviously like other, contrary to what I'm saying, there, there were mavericks within the field of art, but it was the first signs of art being com uh, commodified. In, in terms of um, information, so I'm reading the news and go, ah, you know, like that, like everybody else. But I try and sort of spin that so that it they kind go of, through the machine yeah. almost. Your, your own internal machine. Yeah, yeah. but that's why I, I try and use humour yeah. to sort of tease it out and then get people to sort of question it. But as I say, like the, you know, it will always plague me how mm. how we've got this sort of level of wealth on the planet and mm. no one's doing anything about it. And then you get into your studio and you've got all these different materials and mediums. It's, that must be a, a, a fun task in itself to re, you know, uh, to model these ideas into some form of direction. Yeah, well, I think this is why I probably go a bit loopy <laughs> trying to work it all out. But Mrs. Yeah. Always happy, you know, living on the edge here with <laughs> yeah, politics sort of, and art. Yeah, starts having twitches and things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do your family think? I mean, you know, I'm sure that you're not alone in your, your theories and, uh, you know... They have, well, my, my kids are... Um, uh, they, I think they grew up not having any kind of clue about what it is they do. And then my daughter, uh, I think one day, uh, Joe Sugg um, started following me on Instagram. And I was, and, and at the time, genuinely, I went, who's Joe Sugg? <laughs> and uh, I was like, this guy's got like a million followers. Yeah, like, yeah. who is he? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, we're doing something right here. <laughs> so I went and um, talked to my daughter and that was it. That was the day I met Oh, you're it. a superhero now. <laughs> It is a real Batman in effect, right? So <laughs> yes. she was just kind of like, oh my God, you yeah. know, and I was like, really, who, like, just tell me who he is. That, that ever since I've spoke to him and uh, yeah, he kind of- As one does, yeah. awesome. But yeah. So. Man, that's, again, going back to the stoicism of just being creative a lot. It's, well, <laughs> you've you got to make mistakes, right? Like, mm -hmm. unless you, I guess that's the thing, is, is that art is for the brave. You just got to, yeah. Or, or music is for the brave. Like, yeah. you just gotta say, I'm doing it my way, right? Yeah. It's a very kind of punk, I yeah. do it my way version, Sid Vicious type yeah. thing. So, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> What's the future, my friend? What is the future for Heath Kane? Um, just more pro provocative kind of, or antagonism, I guess. Uh, big breaths <laughs> and. Uh, just enjoy the ride, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's the most important thing. Enjoy the ride. Thank you so much for joining us, my brother. Thank you. My guy. Pleasure. Awesome. Heath Kane. <laughs>